Well, good morning. Happy, happy Monday to all of you. It's a beautiful day. 74 degrees, not a cloud. Well, there's a few clouds in the sky. And last night was the full moon. We couldn't see it because of the storm that came through. I don't know if you got a storm, but we got a humdinger of a storm. And then that storm went through. But this morning when we woke up, uh, the this moon was bright and shining in the west. And so it was moon shadows this morning. So it was beautiful. I love this time of the month when the uh, when the moon casts its shadow early in the morning. And let's see. So any exciting news over the last time? Oh, yeah. I finally had uh, my grandchild was born. Apparently, my daughter was feeling contractions on Friday morning, about one o'clock in the morning. And she had scheduled an induction. This was quite a ways past the due date. So she had scheduled an induction on Friday, but she never made it to the appointment. She went into the hospital. I think they went in about four o'clock in the morning and the nurse, the on, the nurse on duty said, oh, you're not ready yet because you're." Con- she just listened to the contractions and the contractions were quite a bit apart. But Curie is like, I'm pretty sure this is a, this is a birth. And so um, the, they found another nurse on duty who came in and said, yep, you're, you're, you're ready. So they, they brought her into the hospital, they gave her an epidural. And then uh, I think by 10 o'clock in the morning or noon, I'm not entirely sure of the time because there's a time difference. But um, we, we found out that she gave birth. And it's a healthy baby boy. It's nine pounds, five ounces. My daughter is five foot four, five foot six. I don't know. My daughter's very tiny, 100 pounds. And so that's like a tenth of her body weight in a baby. Oh, my goodness. So big boy, big boy. His name is Colton. Colton McKenzie. And uh, the McKenzie is interesting. McKenzie is one of those names that's... uh, boy or girl. Apparently the spelling is different if it's a boy or girl. But my daughter, my my wife's brother, his name is Todd, um, has a child named Mackenzie. And, uh, and when she was 18, she went to live with Jesus. Um, so, and Mackenzie and my daughter Kyrie were very, very close growing up. So that was... Um, uh, probably always on her mind to use Mackenzie somewhere in her kids' names. And uh, so obviously my, my brother-in-law and his wife, my brother and sister-in-law, uh, are excited about that and uh, honored to remember, to remember a remarkable young woman, Mackenzie. Um, and she was a ballet dancer. Uh, and she even came in and did some liturgical dance at our church once when she was maybe 16 years old or something like that, 15 or 16 and uh, it was really quite beautiful. She wore a white dress and just danced on stage. It was really quite quite remarkable. Um, let's see. So that was the most exciting thing that happened in our weekend. So Friday, we were so excited to learn that we had a new grandchild. By the time we, we saw a few pictures, and then she got home, and uh, and now the baby's at home. So we've done some FaceTiming with our daughter and seen the baby and she seems to be doing okay. The uh, the obviously she's on painkillers, but as far as as her health goes, she says I'm I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, after pushing a bowling ball out, um, she's doing you know as well as any of us would do. So she's she's at home. She's with the baby. I think she has a doctor's appointment today just to make sure. You know, they try to get you into the new pediatrician to take a look and see if everything's going well. But appear, by all outward appearances, he's doing quite remarkable. And so now they have four. Now, now I have four grandchildren from that that family, and then I've got two grandchildren from another family. And, um, and you know, the, the grandchildren keep multiplying. <laughs> so that's just, uh, we praise God for each and every one of them. They're each special in their own way. And I can tell you that the next mm, how many years with all those grandchildren is going to be quite remarkable. All right. So um, let's see. I think 
Um, anything else? Just beautiful. Yeah, we had that rain. Well, I had rain. Apparently not everyone had rain, <laughs> but we had quite a humdinger of rain. And so this morning was really just quite beautiful out there, fresh and beautiful. And, you know, even if it doesn't rain, you still get the, the sense of, of uh, you know, that, that storm clouds and the smell and all that sort of thing, which is always fun. Um, let's see. Let's go to birthdays. We have a remarkable birthday this morning. We celebrated it yesterday with a cake in church, and that's Dick Phillips. Happy birthday, Dick. Today is your birthday and we praise God for um, bringing you into this earth. Mm, how many years ago? <laughs> more than we more than we can count, but uh, but we we're we're grateful for all of that. And then I believe Jordan is it Jordan Hilden that has a birthday today too. Yeah, Jordan Hilden has birthday today. So you're you have birthdays with her, and uh, we praise God for you, and uh, we're thankful for you, and may you have a great day. So let's see, what else? I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and get into our study. We are towards the tail end of the reign of King Solomon. And we're going to find out today that uh, Solomon doesn't always uh, go through life without enemies or people who want to have rebellions against him. So today we're going to learn about a few of them. And we left off in verse 25 last time, so we'll pick up here in verse 26 of 1 Kings chapter 11. Also Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials, an Ephraimite from Zereda, and his mother was a widow named Zeruah. So we don't know a whole bunch about him. It's Jeroboam, son of Nebat. He rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials, so not any of the line of him. Uh, and he was an Ephraimite from Zereda, that's to the north, and his mother was a widow named Zeruah. Now here, verse 27, here is the account of how he rebelled against the king. Solomon had built the terraces and had filled the gap in the wall of the city of David, his father. Now Jeroboam was a man of standing, and when Solomon saw how well the young man did his work, he put him in charge of the whole labor force of the tribes of Joseph. So the tribes of Joseph are to the north, and apparently he was an official, and he was put in charge of filling the gaps in the wall of the city of David, his father. So he's, dare I say, he's a civil engineer. <laughs> and a man of standing. He's in charge of construction projects and apparently does a pretty good job. He built terraces. Terraces are, are retaining walls, basically. They're, they're ways to, to get an elevation. If you have a natural grade of elevation, sometimes the only thing you can do on that is... Uh, maybe grow grapes or something like that. But even growing grapes is hard because you have to walk up and down the terraces or uh, the slope of the hill. So terraces are a great way to kind of flatten out a certain area and to kind of build a retaining wall so you can get an area where you could do um, build a house, have some agriculture, whatever. But he had built, um, he had b built, filled in the gap of the wall of his, uh, of David. And apparently he was quite successful about that. He was a, a person who was able to get things done. And when Solomon saw how well he got things done, he put him in charge of even more things. And pretty soon he was in charge of the labor force of the tribes of Joseph. And so he is there as a official in Solomon's court. And he shows his prowess at being an official, and so he continues to rise in the government administration. He's a, he's a bureaucrat, <laughs> bureaucrat, civil engineer, and now he's in charge of the labor force, which happens, right? I mean, if you're good in management in some areas, sometimes they'll put you in management of other areas. So he was good at managing people and building, so they put him in, all, in charge of all the labor. Verse 29, about that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh met him on the way wearing a new cloak. And the two of them were alone out in the country. 
And Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. And then he said to Jeroboam, Take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom of Sol- uh, the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you 10 tribes. But for the sake of my servant David in the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of, Jer- of Israel, he have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshiped the Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in obedience to me, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my decrees and laws as David Solomon's father did. So if you'll remember, the curse to King Solomon from God was that the, the kingdom will become divided And because Solomon brought in so many foreign wives and he set up temples to all these various gods in Jerusalem, God told Solomon that he would rip the tribes of Israel out of his hands, but that he would allow one tribe to remain uh, for the sake of his father David. And we know that that tribe is the one that produces Jesus. And so there's this prophet, and his name is Ahijah, and he has a cloak, apparently a brand new cloak, and he tears the cloak into 12 pieces representing the 12 tribes of Egypt, or of Israel. And he says to Jeroboam, he gives him 10 pieces, and he says, these are going to be your 10 tribes, and you're going to rule over them because the kingdom is going to be torn asunder, and Solomon will only have, the Solomon and his descendants will only have the south tribes. You, as this great official in Solomon's court, You're now in charge of all the labor. Well, you're going to be, at some point, king or in charge of all the northern tribes. Uh, Ahijah continues on. He's he's continued, but he's continued to quote God. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose and who obeyed my commands and decrees. I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You'll be king over Israel if you do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me, and do what is right in my eyes. By obeying my decrees and commands, as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David, and will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. So Solomon is being told by this Ahijah that he will be uh, put in charge of the northern ten tribes. And the northern ten tribes, there's the area to the north, which is Galilee, and then south of Galilee, at the time of Jesus, you have Samaria, and then south of Samaria, you have Israel, Jerusalem. And so the twelve tribes, that are the ten tribes to the north, include a large mass of land, but it becomes the Samaritan. eventually it becomes the Samaritans. And they worship the same God, but they worship on a different mountain. And the northern tribe and the southern tribe eventually become Israel and Samaria. And the Israelites don't like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans don't like the Israelites. As a matter of fact, the the Israelites will walk around the region of Samaria so they don't have to go through Samaria because they don't like the Samaritans, even though they purportedly worship the same God. The God that King David worshiped, And the the temple that Solomon built is in Jerusalem, the kingdom to the south. And Samaria ends up building their own place to worship God in the land of Samaria. But this this is kind of the beginning of that break. And so when you hear the story of the Good Samaritan, when you hear about the conflict between Israel and Samaria, how they don't like each other, it's it kind of has its root here. Although they were only joined together by happenstance in the in the rule of King David, it was never going to be a perfect. If David and Solomon had 
really worked hard, they probably could have kept the 12 tribes together, but, but they didn't. And Solomon, for all of his wisdom, was not able to create a system in place to be able to keep the 12 tribes together. What, who was it that said, um, there's a great philosopher, I think, uh, hmm, I can't remember what it was, but said that uh, all, all issues with governance come back to the structure of the governance. <laughs> in other words, you have to be very, very purposeful to create the right structure because the structure dictates everything else. And for uh, it, uh, it came up recently because of the United States. The United States is a representative democracy and really, really works very well and has worked well for the last 250 years. But... But that structure has a flaw, and the structure is, and many people have noticed this, is that it is very easy for the majority to vote for things that the government's going to do for them at the expense of the government uh, overspending. And everybody wants their piece of the government spending. And there's really no way to, the only way to fight against that is to put leaders in place that control the budget very tightly. For example, Cal Calvin Coolidge, who had a balanced budget and a very, very well-balanced budget and cut things. You have Javier Malay in Argentina who is cutting the budget to live in a balanced budget. Who, who was it recently that said that he could solve the budget issue in one fell swoop, and that was if anybody in the, in the Senate or the House doesn't pass a balanced budget, then they're, they cannot run for re-election. <laughs> he said, if you do that, you could have a balanced budget every year. And maybe that is the solution. Who knows? But, um, but uh, Jerusalem is going to become a divided city, and, and Solomon could have put in a structure in place by which the the a representative they didn't have representative democracy back then so he he could have he he sent his his servant Jeroboam to be in charge of the uh, the slaves up there the labor up there but he didn't um, he didn't put anything else into place and maybe it was too early in the forms of government to even know that he should put something into place but. But the structure dictates that the kingdom is going to become divided. It's too large of a kingdom, and none of the rulers that come after Solomon are strong enough to keep the kingdom together. <clears throat> That's pretty much the bottom line. Um, and But the southern kingdom will remain because of David, and, of course, Jesus comes out of that. All right. Um, verse 40. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt to Shishak the king and stayed there until Solomon's death. Um, verse 41, as for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of the annals of Solomon? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years, and then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. So Solomon dies. He reigned in Jerusalem over all of Israel for 40 years. And then after he dies, his son becomes Rehoboam. And uh, Rehoboam then uh, takes over Israel. But now we have competing forces. We have Rehoboam, who is in Israel, at the capital city in Jerusalem, but then you've got this Jeroboam who's in charge of the labor to the north, and he's now been told by this prophet that he's going to be in charge of the northern ten kingdoms. So we can see here the seeds of dissension between the two, <clears throat> the northern and the southern kingdom. Now, did I, did I miss something? Did I? I'm just looking here because, um, yeah. All right, we'll continue on. Verse, uh, we'll go to chapter 12. Um, so Rehoboam went to Shem, Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. And when Jeroboam, son of Nabat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, 
He returned from Egypt, so they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. And Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people? They replied, If today you'll be servant to these people, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of his elders, gave him, and consulted the young men who he had grown up with who were serving him. He asked them, What is your advice? How should we answer these people, saying to me, Lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, These people have said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah, the Shechonite. So um, this, is, this is pretty much, <laughs> this is where it all happens, right? Uh, I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. There's this uh, musical out there, a rap musical called uh, Hamilton. And um, Hamilton was in the room where it happened in the early part of the United States. Jeroboam says, we'll be kind to you, but the, your father had heavy taxes and the heavy taxes were significant, and we know that he built a great palace, and we know that he was the wealthiest man there ever was. We know that he was wise. He was our ruler. We had confidence in him. He was the son of King David, who was the greatest king of all time. So we gave him quite a bit of leeway. But he's now dead, and what we're all, the only thing we will serve you. We will be. We will keep keep the kingdom united. If simply you reduce taxes and don't make the burden as much as it was under your father, King Solomon. And so this Rehoboam goes to his advisors and he says, what should I do? And they said, yeah, maybe you should reduce the taxes. If you can keep the kingdom together and reduce the taxes, you'll be fine. You got plenty of money. Your father was a very wealthy man. The palace is built. I mean, everything's fine. You don't need all this you can you can cut the fat a little bit and give them a break. And if you do that, then they will serve you for a long time. But then he goes to his friends that he grew up with, and his friends are all people who want to be near the king. And they're like, no, get more taxes. You're the king. You can You can get more taxes, and then you can give us favors, and we'll get more powerful. And boy, doesn't this sound like Washington today. It, it, it's and every country, right? Every ruler of every country wants more and more and more and more taxes because the more taxes that you get, the more things you can do and the more people you can give the money to and then you'll get money and donations to win the next election. And uh, there's, no, there's no reason why you can't just continue to, to, to make you know, the government bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you need more taxes to do that. And this is the path that is before Jeroboam, or Rehoboam. Do I, do I limit government and try to please the people and not have the burden of taxes so high, or do I increase the taxes and government continues to increase? This is a crucial time at the point of Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And unfortunately, it sounds like King Rehoboam is going to go down the wrong path as does every kingdom. And as soon as you, as soon as it becomes more about government and the success and the big largesse of government, then it, it becomes over. And there have been times when there have been some leaders throughout history that have tried to make government smaller, have been successful in doing that, but it takes a strong leader to do that. 
and a, a very, very good leader to do that. And so it's not unique to the United States. It's also, <laughs> it's also something that happens in Israel's history. All right. Uh, I think we'll end it there and then we'll, uh, we'll pick up the story next time. Gracious God, thanks for this day. Um, thank you for uh, the birthday today. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you give us, fill us with your love and your grace until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, today is the opening school chapel for the school year. School starts today and it begins with chapel. And we place our hands and our future in our almighty God and I'm excited about that. The, the, the verse, the theme verse for the school today is 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use your gifts to serve. And um, so that's, that's what we're encouraging our kids today is to use their gifts to serve. And I'm preaching on that, which I preached on on Sunday. And then I also gave a devotion on it last week to the staff. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, everyone has a gift, and um, we should use our gifts to serve. That's why we come together as a church, right? Um, it's almost like first. Uh, uh, it's almost like uh, Ephesians four eleven. He's called some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the service of God. That's He's all given us different gifts to equip us, and we're going to talk about that this morning. All right, so I think we'll end it there. Hey, thanks for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Hope you have a great day in the Lord, and uh, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.